We see some pretty special things on the Antiques Roadshow, but when it comes to provenance, it doesn't get better than having a royal seal of approval. In this episode, we've reached the ermine-trimmed corner of our collection as we dust down the treasures that were once touched by royalty. Yes, there are some fabulous roadshow finds with impressive royal provenance. Coming up in this edition, we get an intimate insight into the royal family. Well, my grandfather was a gamekeeper on the royal estate at Sandringham. Yes. But he also had the special responsibility of living at the kennels and looking after the dogs of the royal family. Also, the King of Glass, Andy McConnell, relives his roadshow debut. I like that. So, um, where'd you find that then? I mean, I was so nervous. I mean, some people complain about having butterflies when they first appear on, you know, theatrical things or whatever. I had actually, you know, there's butterflies in the tummy. I had two brontosaurus mating. And picture specialist Philip Mould unmasks the hidden stories behind magnificent portraits. It became clear that there were other suggestions that the artist might have first thought about, but then decided to paint out. Little ghostly ideas began to, to, to show through and we immediately embarked, therefore, upon an X-ray to see what lay beneath. If the Roadshow's archives were catalogued like a museum's contents, I reckon this first section would be entitled From the Cabinet of Curiosities. And that's a polite way of saying the bizarre or just the downright weird. That doesn't mean they're any the less interesting. Quite the opposite, in fact. We've given some of our specialists special access to the vault to unearth some of their favourite freakish finds. Bob. I've never seen anything like it. What a wonderful piece of modern sculpture. Oh, my word! Probably one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen was a couple of years ago, back in Bishop Auckland, when this gentleman came in with this massive cabinet. I've seen some extraordinary collections on the Antiques Roadshow, but I think this one almost pipped the pose because well, it's a collection of four size. It is indeed, yes. And what makes you want to collect four size? He told me the story about how his father had been an optician and used these as models in order to create full size. This was one of his great passions. He made artificial eyes oh, right. for people. He used these collections not to put into people's eyes, but in fact to use for colour matching. And he had a very faithful group of clients who, who he used to love. And hugely important, you know, cosmetically, I mean, if you did unfortunately lose your eye, you did want something that absolutely matched and nobody could tell. Each absolutely. one was different. And there was, I can't remember now, two and a half, three thousand different examples, all different colours, all different shapes, all different sizes. Some are more bloodshot than others. They are like some of ours, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so in many ways, I mean, they're rather like, I don't know, rather like paperweights you sometimes see. I mean, they are yes, yes. extraordinary. Each individual tray can be worth up to a thousand pounds. So yeah. just in this cabinet alone, let alone what you've got at home, yes. you're talking about twenty-five or thirty thousand pounds. Yes, yes. Well, that's, that's quite an amazing amount, and uh, <laughs> as I say, I love them as part of my family heritage. But uh, I'd never really put a value to them at all. So that's extremely interesting. Who'd want to buy glass eyes? But the market's out there, uh, and they're extraordinarily rare. So an amazing collection, very rare, and, and worth a huge amount of money. An item that was once ordinary can now seem bizarre to us. When one side's done... Back now to the early days of the roadshow, a little embarrassment from a young David Batty. I wonder if you can tell me what this is. I think I know. I think it's a ladies' chamber pot. You're absolutely right. I'm glad you said it rather than me. <laughs> um, I wonder if you know that it had a particular name. No, no. I don't. It's called a Bordeloo. It's bizarre in the sense that, compared to the way we live today, its function would seem to be really odd. And, of course, one finds um, sideboards during the 18th century with a little cupboard at the back in which there was a pewter chamber pot for use, curiously enough, at the dining table. 
because after the ladies had left, uh, the gentlemen sat round with their port and their cheese and their nuts, and the chamber was passed round at the dining table. It's a curious <laughs> reflection on the times. I suppose, you know, we're going back 30 years or so, and in those days, you know, a young man talking to an elderly lady about sort of leakage. I mean, it just, you didn't do it. And so I was, I was pushing the boundaries quite a lot, I think. Um, and I think I was probably embarrassing myself the further I dug down with the story. Our next weird item provoked a strong reaction from Hilary Kay. One of the most remarkable and, and, and interesting objects that came in was at Wisley when somebody delivered to me a bound fact, foot, a model of a bound foot, in a tiny shoe from China round about 1880, I guess. What I'm looking at here with you is an embroidered Chinese shoe which was made for Chinese ladies, this is not a child's shoe, no. who had their feet bandaged. Mm. In fact, the interesting thing about this shoe is it's the first time I've ever seen one with a model of a bandaged foot. And this is what the Chinese did to their ladies. I found this object actually quite shocking. Uh, I'd seen the shoes before, but I'd never realized exactly what was done to the foot in order to get it into those shoes. Uh, the bones were restricted, really, mm. from childhood onwards in tight, tight bindings. Yes. Yeah. So this is what adult ladies like you and me mm. would have. They, their feet ended in this extraordinary club yes. with the toes tied round underneath. underneath. The Castle of May was a, a, a bizarre experience in every sense. The weather was so awful, the setting was so wonderful, everything was in conflict, and we really had a horrible day in weather terms. But I was confronted by a man carrying a sort of black, ill-defined object with various wooden plugs in it. I have no idea what I'm holding. You tell me. Well, some people find it uh, hard to take as, as an object of beauty, but um, that is a very useful um, item if you were fishing, and that actually was once a dog and is now a dog skin boy. So this is a dead dog, and how is it made waterproof? Well, this black or dark brown shiny substance is actually Archangel tar, and that was used for waterproofing before rubber, before tarmacadam, right. etc. Well, they were common objects in maybe 150 years ago, 200 years So this years. is a remarkable survival. He then revealed a story about how dead dogs, or de dogs' bodies, with all the apertures sealed, worked very well as fishing floats. Now, I thought, is it April the 1st? Yeah, they so they're all talking about on the tide. Absolutely. And there wouldn't have been one. There would have been a whole sort of herd of them. This was good news. Flop. This meant that there were uh, the good catches there, and they would say, oh, the dogs are dancing. I've never seen another dead dog. I did ask the owner if they were common. He said no, but they, he knew of three or four. And I will imagine I will go to my grave not seeing another floating dead dog. The dogs are dancing means you're in luck. It's you're good in luck it's... and they're bobbing up and down. So it's a funny phrase, but it was also a joyful time for the fishermen. I think it was a good time not to be a dog. Um, but, you know, there we are. And then, of course, valuation. What is the value of a dead dog? There is no way on the roadshow I'm going to value a dead dog. No, it's just totally unique. If you think you've got an object that can outdo that lot in the oddity stakes, bring it along to a roadshow. We'd love to give it the once over. So far this series, we've seen some confessions from familiar experts about how nervous they were the first time they found themselves in front of the cameras. They seem so calm and confident, don't they? Take our glass man, Andy McConnell, perhaps the most extrovert of all our team. Yet even he tries to forget the first time he got the director's cue. 
my first record was um, it was great. It was you know a young guy had been to a boot fair and he'd picked up um, uh, this Keith Murray vase. It was a kind of you know green torpedo. It was, it was quite a nice piece of English thirties glass, and he'd bought it for two quid at a boot fair or something. So my opening line in that one doesn't get training for this. My opening line to him was, um, and so sir, where did you steal this from? And of course, cut, stop. <laughs> so um, where'd you find that then? Yeah, I got it at a car boot sale. So. Car boot. And how much did you? Uh, how much were you extorted for this item? I pay three pounds for it. Three quid. There never had been a spe glass specialist on the Antiques Roadshow. You know, there have been 420 <coughs> ceramics experts, 7,255 paintings people, 9,415 furniture people, but Three never quid. one um, glass Keith expert. Murray. Signed Keith Murray, New Zealand architect. Couldn't find any work after the Wall Street crash and turned to designing porcelain pottery for Wedgwood and glass for Stevens and Williams Royal Briley. I mean, I was so nervous. I mean, some people complain about having butterflies when they first appear on, you know, theatrical things or whatever. I had actually, you know, this butterflies in the tummy. I had two brontosaurus mating in my tummy when I, for my first show, Rochdale. If you wanted to replace it, three or four hundred quid. That's Not bad for three quid. But I'll give you a four for it, show you a profit. I don't think so. No, that's the only reason that I do a quick records is that actually, um, I, it's for as long as I can hold my breath. Um, you know, I go, hoo, 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 and then I run out of breath, and that's the end of the record, because otherwise I go, <gasps> and then fall over backwards in a faint. Sometimes I look down the queue at people and their objects at a roadshow. Now try to guess what's going to catch our expert's eye. Thing is, though, they don't take an object at face value the way you or I probably would. They see hidden messages and secret signs. Portrait specialist Philip Mould is a classic example. He spends his days unmasking the great and good, getting to the truth behind the earliest form of spin. Philip has come to Hatfield House in Hertfordshire, which was the childhood home of a historical figure who fascinates him above all others. She was one of the earliest practitioners of the art of self-promotion. There's a lovely quote from the historian Thomas Carlyle, which talks about portraiture being like holding up a candle to history. And I love that idea. A face, in the way that it offers you a slice of the time and the period, in a way that you can identify with and understand, because it is, after all, a person works so much better than 50,000 paragraphs written by the greatest historians. Elizabeth I must be the most, in many ways, glamorous and certainly the most powerful in terms of presence and place in history monarch uh, in the um, history of our nation. I mean, what is so interesting is because she was a woman in a man's world, she understood that there were certain things that needed to be done that played to her strengths. She widened the language and brought spin and art together at a whole new level. The Elizabeth we see represented here in the iconic rainbow portrait is a far cry from her modest beginnings. She was 60 when this was painted, and a woman very much in control of her image. I mean, to me, this is the high water mark of Elizabethan portraiture. I mean, you can read it like a book. The gold robe itself is covered with these dismembered eyes and ears. I mean, the symbolic power of it is just unequivocal. They're not even decorative, it's just telling you something. It's saying loud and clear just how famous she is. She's someone who's talked about in the taverns. She's someone who is seen from afar. She is the, the great goddess of the new age. And then the pearls, the pearls that suffuse the picture as well. The pearls of virginity, of course. She's a virgin queen, she's not married. Don't forget it. But the more I look into Elizabeth's life in relation to her portraiture, so you see that these faces, these bodies, this jewellery, this expression and symbolism varies so much. And 
I came across recently a most interesting early example, one of a small clutch of portraits that show you just how radically she transformed, how she basically reinvented herself in paint. Philip's most recent find is the young Elizabeth when she just ascended the throne. I was thrilled to, to have an unknown portrait and not only was it a very important early portrait, but it was one of those done just at the moment that she was surfacing uh, as queen. Not a glamorous image, but more just few. You know, my sister's dead, I'm queen, take a look at me. We restored her. It became clear that there were other suggestions that the artist might have first thought about, but then decided to paint out. Little ghostly ideas began to show through, and we immediately embarked, therefore, upon an X-ray to see what lay beneath. So, what have you found out? Well, this is the image of the uh, picture, as it is hidden away underneath. Right. You've got changes in the composition. Oh, the hand is in a very different shape. The hand is in a different shape. You can see here the book that we've got on the mm -hmm. final version. But underneath here, you've got this orb. And then there's difference here, it seems, in the, in the, in the style of the lace as well. But this is a much more pure, puritanical, pr Protestant type of lace work, um, as opposed to this more mm. um, elaborate, mm. beaded jewel. Mm. So she's ba basically had a full makeover, really. She's been changed from this opulent uh, portrait to the... Mm. From the secular to the, to the religious. A exactly that, yeah. So, so, so this is an early example of spin doctoring. This is mm. the queen yes. or her advisor or someone like that of that nature saying, doesn't look good like that, mm. Your Royal Highness. Yeah. Throwing or perhaps Her Royal Highness herself is saying it, yes. <laughs> yeah. And instead, yeah. why don't you represent yourself as a pious head of the church yes, yes. rather than a secular head of state. Yeah, that would make sense. The process of manipulation and representation of her face and body to the nation is beginning. Elizabeth's reinvention didn't stop there. Hanging on my back gallery wall greeting me every morning is such a radically different picture. The picture of Elizabeth I five or six years into her reign. And it just shows you how very different art can make someone appear. And the contrast from this almost hatching insect that you see in the earlier portraits to this strutting pheasant of, of, of a queen uh, is a testament to just how firmly she understood and wanted to harness the power of art when it came to presenting her to the world. And it's all to do with this, this massive, thick, rich backdrop of vegetables and fruits, all twinned, and all with one message, which is fertility, marriageability, come and get me. About this time, she was meant to have suffered from smallpox. They thought that she was about to die. The House of Lords came to her and said, Please name an heir. She said, almost as a riposte to them, how dare you ask me to name an heir? I can produce my own. I'm a fertile woman. The ripe fruits, the pomegranate that are bursting with fertility and pips, every piece of greenery was her way of saying, I'm not barren and I can have a child. Leave off. And so what, at first glance, knocks you back as a sort of hugely ornate expression is in fact a rather primitive, possibly even poignant one. It's, I can find a husband, I can have children. And why poignant? Because she never did. She's always captured my imagination. How could she not? She was the person who ruled over a, a transformed England that then reached out across the world and changed itself, and indeed the world in the process. She's also a woman on a man's stage, and to have pulled off what she did, and to have done it with such style as evidenced in her portraiture, she is a great inspiration. 
It's fascinating to think that we can still learn even more about an iconic royal like Elizabeth I just by looking carefully at her portraits. We often see items that have royal connections on the Antiques Roadshow and they offer a unique insight into the family behind the crown. Nine times out of ten, such precious pieces end up on the tables of our royal correspondents, jewellery expert Geoffrey Munn and books buff Clive Farahar. This is a splendid collection of royal ephemera re relating to Queen Mary, and I must say it has a very topical ring about it. These are all notes to her chef. Is yes, that right? That's right, yes. Um, saying wonderful things like, do not give celery again when the Princess Royal dines here, and the dish was not popular, and so on and so forth. Another, please make a note that Princess Alice and Lord Athlone do not eat potatoes. I think it's absolutely wonderful. Royal objects obviously create a frisson at uh, the roadshow, as far as I'm concerned, because I love handling uh, that sort of material. Um, any letter that comes from a member of the royal family tends to be, um, it, obviously it's very personal, and I love that sort of thing. So the frisson is mine, all mine, and I love to know where they come from and how they've got hold of them. My father went to school with Miss Tramelow's son, and when he died... He was the, he was the chef. He Mr. was the chef at Mr. Amelo. Amelo, yes. He was at Buckingham Palace and then went to Queen to Marlborough House with Queen Mary. After the death of After George V. Yes. yes. And these had been kept, obviously, by the chef. Uh, he should have thrown them away or handed them into the archives or whatever, but he kept them. And it showed Queen Mary making quite a bother about the meals and who liked what and who didn't like what. You have this with some 40 or 50 notes in, yes. and you have this lovely signed photograph, yes. which I assume came from the um, same place. Yes. Signed by Queen Mary in the war. Yes. Wilton House provided Geoffrey Munn with an unexpected royal delight. Well, it was belonged to my mother-in-law. Um, she arrived one day with a, a little bowl, and she called it a lucky dip, and she asked me if um, I would like to choose a piece of jewellery for both of my children. Amazing. Well, I think this is probably the most spectacular lucky dip I've ever seen in my life. And, and it does put an immediate context onto the objects that we find, and it's a provenance, and it's a very exciting one. Well, it says Princess Elizabeth, daughter of King Charles I. She was born in, in um, 1635, and she died in 1650, so it's a remarkably short life, actually. And in a way, this may be some kind of memorial to that life. And here is a, is a very beautiful stone very in a contemporary. Very sparkly, and it's mm. doing it right now. It seems to like the mm. attention we're giving it. Um, anyway, so is it a Stuart relic or not? To be perfectly honest, I think it probably is, which is a very exciting thing for me to say. I think a link with royalty can add enormously to the, to the commercial value of an object. And how on earth wants to value this, I haven't the slightest idea. Maybe seven, eight, nine thousand pounds for it without any reference to provenance whatsoever. Put the provenance on and the sky's the limit, perhaps. Maybe 15,000 isn't wrong. I think the nicest things one sees on roadshows that come from royalty are letters of a very personal nature. Uh, this is from Windsor Castle. Dear Mrs. Way, is that Way? Yes. Thank you so very much for looking after, and I think it's Kling, is it? Kling, perhaps. Kling, Kling yes. So beautifully, he seems to have quite recovered from his illness. Who is Kling? Well, Kling must have been one of the dogs that uh, Elizabeth and Margaret and, and left that's... for my, my grandmother and my grandfather to look after while they were away from Sandringham. Was he dog keeper to the royal family? Well, my grandfather was a gamekeeper on the royal estate at Sandringham, yes. but he also had the special responsibility of living at the kennels and looking after the dogs of the royal family. Queen Elizabeth, as she then was, also came to visit my grandmother, and on one occasion um, we were playing cricket, uh, just with a tennis bat and a uh, ball, and they took part in it. And another occasion, they brought along the corgis, and uh, we and my cousins were running around in our vest and knickers in the summer, and the corgis chased us upstairs. And I think they enjoyed this human aspect and visiting us on that, that basis, because they said in the letters that they regarded my grandmother as one of their friends, somebody to come and visit as soon as they got to Sandringham. 
This one is signed by Albert uh, Sandringham Norfolk, with many thanks for looking after and training Scummy. Scummy or Scrummy. Scrum that would have been one of the gun dogs. Um, because my, father, my grandfather, being a gamekeeper, would have known all about gun dogs and their training of them. And signed Albert, who is, of course, George VI. This was a very private side of them, and that was, I think, absolutely charming. Now, I think one of the most exciting royal discoveries that I made was a memorial stick pin made um, to Queen Victoria's order to commemorate the death of Prince Albert. Probably been in our possession for about 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. Made, have only paid about a tenner for it. A tenner, isn't that uh, wonderful? Any more than that. Well, I mean, it uh, it's a most exciting jewel, this, yeah. because it's a memorial to one of the most famous love affairs that has ever taken place on this planet, you know. Yes. It's a memorial pin for Prince Albert. It's got his cipher on the front, a, a, an A under a royal crown, but more importantly on the back it says, in remembrance of the beloved prince, December the 14th, 1861, from VR, from Victoria Regina. I think the love affair between Prince Albert and Victoria was, was a very public one. It was a very intense one. Um, Queen Victoria wrote that she'd only had to look into his dear sunny face to make her adore him. And I think she really did adore him. And when it opens here, we can see a contemporary photograph of the Prince Consort within it. Have you ever had it professionally valued? Well, only up to about a 200 pounds, actually. 200 pounds yeah. for a piece of jewellery of national importance, really. My goodness, I don't think yeah. it's enough. I think it's worth 3,000 pounds of anybody's money. 3,000? 3,000, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. yeah, it's a thrilling thing. It's just as much an emblem of her grief as the Albert Memorial. The Albert Memorial is a vast architectural monument to Prince Albert. This is a tiny stick pin. But she wrote to King Leopold of the Belgians the day after Albert's death and said, my life as a happy one is ended. The world is gone from me. And this tiny jewel says it all about the most important person living in the world at that time. Clive Farahart and Geoffrey Munn with some of their most memorable royal finds. Which just about brings us to the close of this episode of Priceless Antiques Roadshow. Next time we revisit the archives to hear stories of unsung heroes from wartime. And this gentleman was so quiet, unassuming and a real hero. I, I felt very privileged to be there that day. Ceramic specialist John Sandon tries his hand at a time-honoured tradition. Sandons have a reputation for being at about the worst potters imaginable. I don't think this is going to be a masterpiece on the future antique roadshow. And we delve into the story of domestic technology with more fascinating finds. It's an amazing object, isn't it? I mean, it shrieks, literally, 60s at you, yes, these absolutely. incredible colours. I mean, yeah. so sort of dynamic and vibrant. Before we go, another classic roadshow outtake. Pictures expert Mark Poltimore usually has fabulous eye for detail. We all have our off days. Bye. Here we have a 17th century subject, but in fact it's probably painted in the 20th century, in the early part of the 20th century, probably about 1900, 1905, something like that. Well, the date's on there. You're absolutely right. Can we start again? <laughs> 1891. You made me rush. <laughs> Shall we start again now? I was out by 10 years. Come on.